Would you like to discover the secret to getting through to just about anyone? Actually, to getting through to anyone. Well, if so, stay tuned because we're going to let you know how. This is Book Circle Online, featuring in-depth discussion, insight, news, and commentary on all the world's leading book titles and their authors. And now, Book Circle Online. All right, everyone. Thank you, and welcome to another edition of Book Circle Online. This is your favorite platform for all things books, and we are really excited to be here. I'm your host today, Katerina Kazayas, and I am joined in studio by the great Mark Goulston. Mark, welcome to the program. I'm so excited. I, I think I have spit in the corner. Right <laughs> my my <laughs> wife would point we're gonna, out. We're yeah, going to wipe ourselves yeah, yeah. first. That's right. Well, thank you for being here with us. Always glad to Yes, see you. absolutely. We are going to be discussing Just Listen. So for anyone out there that has ever had difficulty getting that other person to just listen to you. You know, you have something to say, and for whatever reason, it's just not being heard. How do you get through to them, and how do you get your point across when you have something really important to say? You've written a book, Mark, called Just Listen, and we're going to delve into all of that today. Before we do that, uh, I'd like to introduce exactly who you are, because I know who you are, but we're going to kind of help the guests uh, understand the significance of us having you here in the studio with us. So you are a business advisor, you are a public speaker, you are a coach, you are also a psychiatrist, psychologist. Psychiatrist. Psychiatrist. I get them I always have some mixed up. For you right there now, we go. Yeah. I was going to say, someone needs to help me out. Um, and you have um, been featured many times. You are an author of quite a few books. I think it's six or seven now. Seven now. Seven books. Fantastic. So you're here to impart a little bit of your wisdom with us. You've also been on guests um, on you know prominent, prominent shows like CNN and Fox News, uh, the Washington Post. So it's a real thrill for us to have you here. Well, I'm glad to be here. I, I can hardly wait to find out what we talk about. <laughs> That's right. Uh, before we do get started, a uh, really quick reminder that you can follow us uh, across all of our platforms here at Book Circle, and we know you get excited to do that. Book Circle Online is probably where you're catching us, but we also stream on YouTube and on podcast. So Mark, they can find us everywhere. Good. Which is great. That's um, I want to know, just listen, why a book on listening? What happened? What did you go through? What have you seen in life that caused you to want to write something that helps people become more proficient at listening to each other? Well, you know, like most things in life, you, usually there's some sort of a, a bad, down, dark time that mm -hmm. teaches you the biggest lessons in life. And I remember when I was a psychiatrist at UCLA, one of the worst days I had, I was called by the oncology doctors to see a patient. They paged me and they said, we need an order to put this patient in restraints and to medicate him. I'm a psychiatrist because he's pulling his respirator out, he's pulling the IVs out, he's yes. kicking, and could you come up and write an order? You know, because he's just right. all over the place. So I go into his room and his eyes were as big as saucers. I mean, just like, like, like this. And he was screaming at me through his eyes because he had a respirator tube in. And I said, what is it? And they said, he's just, he's just psychotic. You know, that's why we have to restrain him. And I said, what's going on? And he's, he's screaming at me and his and eyes are like that. this. Yeah. Oh, and, and then uh, I, I gave him a pen to write something down. He's in restraints and he just scribbled. And I, and I thought, well, maybe they're right. And I said, uh, I wrote an order to calm you down. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have your arms and legs so you can't kick and pull things out. And then when everything calms down, we'll take everything away. And he's just going, mm, 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 and he's screaming at me. And you know, and then I went about my day and then the next day I got paged by the oncology doctors mm -hmm. and they said- We need you back. Well, they said, Mr. Jones, that wasn't his name, is uh, off the respirator. Okay. He's sitting up and he asked us to page you. Oh goodness, uh-oh. So. <laughs> So I walk into the room, and his eyes are calmer, but he's looking into my eyes like I'm looking into your eyes, and he, and he seats me in a chair. He says, sit down. Oh, wow. And, with, and I couldn't move my eyes, and he looked at me, and he said, what I was trying to tell you yesterday is that a piece of the respirator had broken off and was stuck in my throat. Oh, my God. And you do know that I will kill myself before I go through that again. Do you understand me? And I looked in his eyes and I said, oh, I'm sorry, I understand. Yeah. But it really taught me that you need to listen into where people are coming from. Mm -hmm. 
and then that served me well because I was a, I was a suicide expert, a suicide interventionist, and probably the real turning point, and this has led to my being able to listen to people from their inside out. So Just Listen is a book about how do you listen to another person from their inside out mm. as opposed to from your, your perspective your of perspective. it. Right. So uh, I was seeing a number of suicidal patients, and one of my first mentors actually started the whole study of suicide, uh, the Suicide Prevention Center in Washington, Los Angeles. And he, what would happen is he would do consultations to still suicidal patients up in the inpatient units that needed to be discharged okay. because you can't keep them there forever. And they're not acutely suicidal, but you can't keep them there forever. Mm -hmm. So he would always uh, meet with them, and he'd make a phone call, and it would always be the same call. His name was Dr. Ed Schneidman, and he'd say, he'd say, Mark, I'm with this lovely young woman. Mark, I'm with this handsome young man. They're in a lot of pain, Mark. You could help them, see them. Mm -hmm. And then they get on the phone, and we make an appointment, and that was the only way they'd be discharged because someone had to see them. Okay. And so I, I saw a number, you're only supposed to see one suicidal person in your practice. I would say a quarter of my practice were suicidal people. Oh my gosh. And my wife will tell you that I never made it through a movie in 10 years without being beat or paged. Wow. So, you know, but, but what it also allowed me to do, though, is it allowed me to throw away the book and be innovative. And so uh, there was one patient that I'll call Nancy that really, uh, really brought that home. Um, and I was seeing Nancy. She had made three or four attempts before I met her before she went into the hospital this time, and I didn't think I was helping her. She would come in, and she wouldn't make eye contact. Mm -hmm. If if you're me, this would be Nancy. Okay. So if you're looking at me... Uh, Just begrudgingly uh, there in she, the room, she, right? Well, she's kind of lifeless. She's sort of like this. Mm -hmm. And so I was moonlighting at a state hospital over one weekend. So once a month, you'd moonlight, you'd cover for other doctors, and this was at a state hospital uh, in called Mo Metropolitan Hospital in Norwalk, California. And so I'd been up about 36 hours. So for any of you who have ever pull, pulled an all-nighter. I'm sure a lot of doctors listening have. <laughs> and, and college students. You know sure. that your physiology and your mind plays tricks on you. So there I am Monday uh, seeing Nancy, and she's in her usual pose like this. And so I'm seated with her, and again, I didn't think I was helping her. I've been seeing her for about six months. She was coming in two to three times okay. uh, a week, and I didn't, uh, uh, that was long as she gone without being hospitalized, so maybe I was helping her, but I didn't think I was doing anything positive. And so on this particular day, uh, I, again, I hadn't slept for 36 hours, and I'm looking out at her, and suddenly all the color in the room turns to black and white. So I'm looking out, and the color is black and white. This is for you now? For me. I'm okay. seeing black and white, and then... It starts to get like cold and chilly, and it was like gray waves like you'd see in the highway in a desert. Okay. And it was just almost like quicksandy, and so I thought I was having a stroke or a seizure. Oh my God. Now, I'm a medical doctor, and okay. so I, th I thought, well, it wouldn't be rude to do a neurologic exam on myself because she's like this, <laughs> and so I, I, I'm going, Nancy. Yeah, so I'm going like so, so I'm going like you're this, checking your pulse, like this, you're checking I'm your like right? this, like oh this, like this. I'm tapping my knees, and I realize I'm all here. I'm not okay. having a stroke or seizure. So what the heck was going on? We'll take a sip now. Yeah, I was going to um, say. <laughs> then I thought, I have this crazy idea that I'm looking at the world through her eyes. Hmm. That when she's looking like this, what she was seeing was what I was what seeing this and feeling. Black, dark, cold dark world. Oh yeah, and and years later, I, I shared that with a pastor uh, from St. John the Divine, a Gothic, a big Gothic cathedral in uh, Manhattan. He said, "You went into the dark night of the soul." Wow. I, didn't, I didn't know Jeez. that at that time. And so, because I was uh, uh, sleep deprived, I actually blurted out something that I probably wouldn't have blurted out. Uh, and you'll understand why. So I, I, I just said, Nancy, I didn't know it was so bad, and I can't help you kill yourself. But if you do, I will still think well of you. I'll miss you. Jeez. And maybe I'll understand why you had to to get out of the pain. And then I thought to myself, don't write that in the medical <laughs> record. I thought, oh, great, I just oh, gave her no, permission. Oh, no, right. And, and I'm thinking, did I say it? Did I think it? I said, ooh, I said it. 
And so she looked at me. She looked at me for the for first, the first time. For the she first time. She sort of woke yeah, up, yeah. yeah. And she looked at me like I'm looking into your eyes and see I can hold your eyes. Right. And I thought she was going to say, thank you for understanding. I'm, yeah. I'm overdue. Sure, right. You what know? did she say? And I said, well, what are you thinking? And she looked right into my eyes like I'm looking into yours. Yeah. And she said, if you can really understand why I might have to kill myself to get out of the pain, maybe I won't need to. And then she smiled <laughs> and gave up her suicidality. And so what I then learned yeah. is people are screaming out at us with their eyes, with what they say in between. And, they're, and if you can just listen into people's eyes, if you can look into anyone's eyes, and if you listen for their hopes or dreams, their fear, their anger, their discouragement, and if you just look for that with no other purpose than to be of service. One of my favorite quotes of all time, it could be my favorite, comes from a psychoanalyst named Wilfred Bion. Mm -hmm. And he said, the purest form of communication is to listen without memory or desire. And what he meant is when we listen with memory, we have an old personal agenda that we're plugging people into. When we listen with desire, we, we have, have a current, uh, a present or future personal agenda that we're trying to plug people into, but we're not listening to them. But how, this is my question, is you were trained, you weren't even trained to do so. I wasn't you, trained to do you, that. You, you, but you, we were intuitive, intuitive enough to understand that you needed to do that, to be of service to these patients. How does the common person get around their mental agenda because we have that right i mean i might be here sitting listening to you but i'm listening to you because i need to do something with that information how do i sit here and just listen to you for you well i think uh, if you can go into a conversation and, and, I, and one of my my last mentor who passed away was a big leadership guy named warren bennis if you search the name warren bennis he uh, he, w he was one of the top three people in leadership. Okay. Uh, and one of the things that Warren used to say is be a first class noticer. Hmm. And so noticing is different than looking, watching, or seeing. So if I'm looking into the camera lens, into your eyes out there, uh, you know, if I'm just looking, watching, or seeing, I see that there's a camera lens looking at me. I'm trying not to be awkward, uncomfortable looking into a camera <laughs> lens. But if I can imagine that I'm noticing through the camera and I'm looking into your eyes and if you're looking into my eyes and if you let me look into your eyes and if I'm looking for where where the hurt is where the anger is where the discouragement is and I am only looking to notice it and join you there so one of the things I discovered in being a suicidologist and I'll teach people now mm -hmm. how to do it, but I don't do it now on the front lines. This was a really poignant thing, and it was a real lesson. Towards the end of seeing suicidal people, and these were multiple attempters who had failed all kinds of things. So imagine if you're feeling that, and if you are feeling that, I want to tell you there's hope. Mm -hmm. Thank you for tuning in, but there is hope. Get yourself listened to. Go. <laughs> uh, Bye, just listen. Bye, just listen. Uh, and, and so if you can imagine that mindset, uh, and you've tried things. And a lot of times, professionals will give you things to try. And you will <laughs> nod from the neck up knowing you're not going to try it. Mm -hmm. So what I used to say to some of these people, because I would listen to them from the inside out, so imagine if you're that in that place, and I'll look into the camera, and what if someone said to you, if it's all right with you, I'm not going to give you any advice or solutions that you're not going to follow. <laughs> and then you're going to have to come back and tell me why you didn't do it. And you weren't even asking me for the advice or solution. What I'm going to do is I'm going to find you wherever you are. And I'm going to keep you company there as long as it takes. And you're going to walk out. And I'm not going to come up with any solutions or advice until you get so bored with my keeping you company that you say, you know, can, can we do something constructive? <laughs> and then we'll come up with something. And so imagine if you're coming from that mindset and what would happen is they would they would start to just cave. 
Well, I was going to say that's exactly what happened. What happened with Nancy, right? So going back to Nancy for a minute, uh, did she recover? Did she did she no, move she w- out of that dark place? <laughs> oh, it's interesting. Um, she went on and got a PhD. She has a couple of kids. <laughs> but one of the things that I told her, because she, this had been going on for years, okay. and I said, "Don't become a psychologist." <coughs> Why? Don't Why did you say that? Well, to I her? said, "Go have fun." Mm. I said. There's too much sadness. If you really listen into people and feel their emotions so they feel less alone, yeah. uh, it's not depressing, but it's incredibly sad. That's been going on for a decade. And then what she would say to me is she said, I can't just take a regular job knowing that you can walk out of hell, and that I did. Mm. So she wanted to be of service. Totally. Okay, yeah, you know, wow. And, 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 and she was. Oh, she was. I mean, wow. I, I, I think she's the best pure therapist uh, you could ever find. Wow. So if you looked so into her go, eyes, people, if you looked in her eyes yeah. and said, have you ever felt so alone and there was no way out and you'd just be better off if you just ended it all? And she would say, I know exactly what that feels she like. She wouldn't even have to say it. Right, yeah, you could feel it. You know. Now I want to go back to what you had said about that wave coming over you and you sort of, you found yourself looking through at the world through her eyes. Has that happened to you again? Has it happened since? Does it happen frequently? Oh, it happens all the time. In fact, so I trained FBI and police hostage negotiators. Cool. And actually, one of the things I would do, if you actually look up uh, FBI hostage negotiation, Goulston, okay. G-O-U-L-S-T-O-N, I think it's on YouTube or Vimeo, one of those things. And what I would do is I would, uh, it was interesting, I, I would come in with a suit and underneath I had a police uniform on and what I would do and you and would you, you strip s- down like Superman well, well not exactly because <laughs> what would happen is these are FBI and police and so you can see it it's an old it's in from the I think the late 90s and I and I took off my uh, uh, sport jacket and underneath it was a police uniform I hadn't shaved for two weeks hmm. uh, I put on a pair of glasses that I think were broken okay. and I looked at them and I said I'm the guy in your department who shot the kid with the plastic gun last year and I've been on medical leave for a year, and I pulled out a gun, put it to my neck, and I said, I've been on medical leave for a year, and unless you talk me out of it, I'm going on permanent leave. And then you live with the ghost of someone you couldn't save, and this time it's one of your own. And then whatever they would do. Um, Holy crow, this was your training? <laughs> this is my training. Holy what, crow. And, whatever, uh, and, and I got amazing testimonials. Uh, 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 and it was often the the start of a training day and got mm-hmm. the highest ratings. And, and no matter what they said, I would just rip, a, rip them a new one mm-hmm. and then I'd pull the trigger. Ah. And I was careful to use a red gun because they say, look, these people are highly trained. They see you pull out a gun. They're you know, going to react, gonna, right, baby? <laughs> and, and then, but from that position, what I could say is, this is what you didn't ask me. Wow. So I could go into character and play that. Actually, my favorite place, and I would love to do more of this if any of you can get me a connection. Mm -hmm. My favorite place for doing this is I used to do these programs at uh, penitentiaries to prisoners who were going to be released in the next... um, Couple of years? In the next six months to 18 months. It was called Rebuilding Trust in Your Family. Mm. So imagine this. I'm being <laughs> the, the, uh, now you're talking penitentiary. You're not even talking a regular, you know, jail. No, this is this is like full. Yeah, 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 this is yeah. full on. Uh, like Terminal Island was right. a local one that I would go to, and the Jeez. chaplains would bring me in. And so these big muscle-bound, uh, usually third-world, you know, prisoners right. would come in. They'd all have their Bibles, <laughs> and so I'd have my, I'd have this kind of jacket on. I take it off. I'd have a black T-shirt on. I grease my hair back. Ha. Huh. And so I and you looked a little and, like and one and of them, yeah. So, and then I said, uh, uh, I said, I'm your younger brother. Okay. Your yep. mom always loves you. Uh, and when you get out, uh, she'll give you a first, second, a third chance because she believes in Jesus. But you know as well as I know that all you'll ever be is a lying sack of crap loser <laughs> who's a disgrace <laughs> to this family. Uh, and if you really love our family. You when shape you get up. Out, you move. Oh wow! Jeez. And, and if you ask me, and <laughs> what if you, do these guys think of you, oh, Mark? No, they, well, it's kind of riveting, I guess. And I said, and if you think I should respect you because you're my older brother, think again. I've been lifting weights too, and I will put your head through the effing wall. How do you uh, How do you like that? Welcome home, bro. 
And then what would happen is I'd get into character, and I uh, and I I would from the inside out I'd be that younger brother, and then from that role play, uh, and I got to the point where they would they were saying to the chaplain, "Get him away from me." They'd be pushing me away because I wow. get I get so in character, and I, they would see you as that family member, right? I get two yeah. feet away from them. Jeez. Uh, and, and again, when I do these trainings, no one can talk me out of it but from that character. So imagine this, though, in the last one I did. Uh, uh, what I would say is, if I'm your younger brother, and you come home, and you're not making eye contact, what we're all going to think is you're planning your next crime. Mm -hmm. And what we don't know is that you feel ashamed, because mm -hmm. you're looking down, and we don't trust that. And if I was your younger brother, this is what might work. You need to meet with me. You need to meet with your kids. You need to meet with everybody individually. And what you need to say to us is, um, I did wrong. Don't make excuses. I did wrong. I paid you know, yeah. uh, my sentence. I'm out. <coughs> uh, and I'm not here to defend myself. And I know that whenever my name is mentioned and that you're related to me, that you feel deeply ashamed and embarrassed whenever anybody knows that I'm related to you. Wow. And you look them straight in the eye, and then w what you say to them is, uh, and, and I am committing to you and God that that place inside you, that you are ashamed that I am related to you in the deepest humiliation that you feel, one day you will be proud. Wow. And what happens is it just, it just rivets the room. And then I say, and they ask me to not do it, but the chaplains are very sweet. <laughs> the last thing I say, but if you go back on that, and I trust you, not only do you deserve to go back to prison, you deserve to burn in hell. And the chaplain said, C can you take the last <laughs> thing up? I said, I said, that's my knockout punch. So wait, wait, wait. So the yeah. last time I did it, I can remember there was one guy who was about 6'6", six, six, okay. and he must have been 300 <laughs> pounds. And as he's walking out back to the yard, yeah. he looked into my eyes, and he took my hand, my right hand with two hands. They were like baseball mm -hmm. gloves. And he looked at me, and he said, I didn't follow everything you said but I listened, and I'm going to remember it. Uh, thank you for coming here. Wow. That, that got to me. I was going to say, uh, did you ever hear from any of these guys after they were out? N no, because part, part, a lot of it was sort of one-off. So one okay. of my problems, and, and if you can help me, uh, yeah. I'm a, uh, and it, by the way, here's one of the reasons that I do what I do from the, the personal okay. thing. Okay. Um, I was a outsider. Okay. Um, growing up, you mean? Yeah, growing up. Okay. And in, what, in what sense? Well, Just well, like part the, I think the, part of it is I the little you know, loner kid. Well, kind part of, of it is I uh, I had a double promotion, so I was mm. you know I was intelligent enough mm. as the. But you were the small kid, I but then the you were the, the, the smart kid, I, I and no in, one likes the smart. I was kid. in right field right. and softball every okay. game, <laughs> you know? and I was kind of socially you know a little bit yeah, backwards. A little awkward, yeah. And so what happened is, and this is why I want to help good people inside mm -hmm. is I realized that uh, I wasn't I was fortunate I wasn't bullied or humiliated mm -hmm. because if I was bully bullied or humiliated I would have gone from outsider to outcast and to I dangerous to dangerous right. to I'm gonna get in and get even but what happened is because I was just ignored mm -hmm. uh, and I felt invisible mm -hmm. I, I I became an outlier mm -hmm. meaning that I can uh, I don't have that need to go back in and destroy mm -hmm. but uh, I uh, you observed and you probably um, uh, absorbed absorbed right? and, and and I thought there but for the grace of God would be me because if wow. I've been bullied and humiliated I can see that when you just take teeter that off that edge right oh, oh yeah. yeah and and that's probably what happened to a lot of these guys yeah or yeah. you know or these people that are suicidal or they get to that tipping point of feeling so alone so outcast so uh, okay so you were sort of on the you 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 managed to have it work in your favor professionally, mm -hmm. um, but that must have been hard getting to that point, right? Did you feel alone growing up? Did you feel? Um, yeah, no, no. I think I, I did. I did feel alone. Okay. Uh, and um, 
Because you talk in the book a little bit about empathetic, em- empathogenic communication. Yeah. yeah. So, so there's uh, there's a form of uh, therapy that I d- uh, created called empathogenic therapy. Empathogenic. Thank you. And what that means is, uh, and why I'm worried about the world, mm. is empathy is the main deterrent to violence. You can't. The the, the glib saying one of my co-authors said is you can't walk in someone else's shoes and step on their toes at the same time. (laughs) (laughs) Wise. And and so what's happening, uh, technology is causing empathy to atrophy. Okay, meaning? Meaning that it's just... Meaning that we're all transactional. Okay. So rather than listening into where people are coming from, we're always trying to see what kind of deal we can swing. Mm. And what happens is there's there's a lot of people who are just not making it to the deal-making level, and they're falling through the cracks. And, uh, and as empathy goes away, I think there's a direct one-to-one correlation between the uh, atrophy of empathy and the rise of violence. Hmm. Well, and <laughs> I was going to say, and, uh, and you're seeing, we're seeing that reflected in our society incredibly so right now. You know, we are, the, the, the level of violence globally is just, it's, it's out of control. You can't go a day without hearing about something happening somewhere to someone of of major importance, you know, whether it's a bomb that killed ninety people, or a or a suicide, or you know, a, a somebody taking a truck and crashing into passerby's, like it, it's nuts. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's probably, as you say, being enhanced by this social media world that we live in, because I think that people, you know, we feel as though we're so much more connected, right? I've got so many Facebook friends, I have so many friends on on this platform and that platform, but when is the last time somebody phoned you? And you heard their voice or said to you, hey, let's get together in person. Mm-hmm. So I think to your point about empathy, I think it's it's partially due to the fact that we are really missing out on this human to human contact, which will fortify and, and, and establish a basis for my giving a damn about you, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to say something sexist, so I expect yeah. you to Okay, slam here we me. go. <laughs> you're either going to slam me or you're going to agree with me. But okay. You, you can't agree with me because all the women in the studio, right. they're going to say, how could you agree with him? <laughs> um, what are you going to say? Women are... And, and, and here we go, folks. And I can say this because women over the years have come in to see me, okay. and I say, what's really going on? And so mm. I'm a good listener. I say, what's really going on? And they'll okay. talk about certain frustrating things. And... But with a number of them, especially women who have children, mm. what they'll say is, I can't find my warmth. I'm a project manager. I'm on top of them about their homework. I'm on top of them about what they're doing, and I can't find my warmth. And a woman without warmth is not a woman. Just like a man without courage isn't a man. And what's happening, mm-hmm. and I'm not blaming it on women, because what's happening is women are not getting help. They're not getting the assistance. Often they have to fight the childlike boyfriend or husband who's, a, who's more of a baby than the kids. <laughs> and so you're there as a project manager. Yeah. Uh, you're juggling everything. You're juggling a full-time job. You're juggling the kids. Oh, you're juggling yeah, the, yeah. The, the non-existent spouse. Yeah. You're juggling, right? Yeah, and, okay. and, and I can't prove this, but I'll okay. say something else sort of outrageous. <laughs> Here we go. Look, outrageous. Yeah, good. yeah. Um, I think there's a connection. I actually wrote a blog on this, and the blog was called um, uh, Maternal Cooling, uh, Childhood Obesity, Hmm. and Global Warming. (laughs) Maternal Cooling, uh, Childhood Obesity, Uh and Global Warming. So here's how I link them together. Uh, A lot of people, when they're in pain and fear, they need comfort. So they eat? So they eat, hmm. and and they need and that comfort is a focused warmth. It's not like hmm. poor baby. It's a focused warmth where their pain, they they don't feel alone in it. Okay, so the the person and then they consume and okay. the global warming is they j- is this conspicuous consumption to hmm. spackle the warmth that, that is lacking that is lacking that they don't even know is lacking, and they do that to self. Self. They replace warmth and comfort oh. with excitement and an adrenaline rush. Off the getting, dessert and the food and the popcorn and the pop and the, and the video games, right, all that. Yeah. Right. Huh. In fact, I'm hearing that a number of women in their 40s yep. are having trouble getting pregnant because their testosterone is too high. But is that not just human hormone, though? I mean, you know, let's let's be honest. At the end of the day, whether they're eating a lot or not eating a lot or stressed or not stressed, they're 40 plus. 
right? So well, that gonna, could be no, just. No, no, I'm talking about childhood obesity. I'm, oh, saying, chi- I'm, okay. saying, I'm saying that children, when children don't get the warmth to comfort themselves, right. they start they eating for and, comfort right, food. Right, okay. And they read for consumption of, of things to make them feel better. Mm-hmm. And it's that consumption that creates global warming and the big right. carbon right, footprint. Right, right, right. And the problem is, I'm not bashing women, because a lot of women will say, well, well, I'm always running on empty. Where am I going to get it from? And, and, I don't, okay, and I'll say something I hopefully empathic uh, to women okay. now. Okay. So, so now that, now that you're, uh, please tweet all your hate mail. I was going to say, we're going to get a lot of comments, but keep going. Yeah. Uh, this is not an unusual thing. So over the years, and I don't practice anymore. I, you know, I speak at conferences, and I speak at women's conferences sometimes. Are women let you in? I'm kidding. They do. They do. <laughs> That's a whole other story. Okay. Uh, um, but uh, go on. I uh, cut you off. But um, uh, w- what happened with a few women uh, that I've seen, I've said, uh, I know what you're afraid of. And they say what? Uh, and these are women who are very high achievers, but you know they're unhappy inside. Mm-hmm. or something. And I said, I don't think you're afraid of being controlled, rejected, uh, or even uh, insulted. I don't think you like those, but you're well defended. Okay. What are they afraid of? I think what you're really afraid of is to be completely, unconditionally safe, and you don't have to do anything to earn it, and there's nothing you can do to lose it, uh, and you can exhale uh, with everything you've been just holding in because you've never felt safe. And what happens is these women, they, they, some of them, they just start to cry. And mm. I said, what happened? And they said, you just hit a nerve. Mm. And so they haven't felt sort of that unconditional warmth. Uh, I want to say something also to the men. because, uh, and if I, I was going to say, are the women lacking that from the male counterpart? Are they lacking it from society as a whole? Are they lacking it intrinsically? Well, I, 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 and I mean that's a generalization because there are a lot of women that are perfectly happy and balanced. Okay, well, you something, know, something disclaimer. I, okay, something I will say yeah. is, uh, it's mainly that's more of I think a white middle class phenomenon because if because there is a lot of maternal warmth in mm-hmm. third world uh, mm. uh, moms, uh, Latino, black. I mean, their 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 kids know their mama loves them. Okay, and that sort of centers. Where do you them. think the disconnect came in from middle America? I think what happened, especially for middle America, is a lot of women, especially the, with the divorce rate, mm. they got sick and tired of thinking they could rely and depend on men who it turned out they couldn't rely and depend on. And plus, they said, I'm just, just going to do it on my own. I'm not going to depend on a man. I'll well, they had no myself. choice. I don't think they had a that, choice, that's right? I mean, true. Um, and, so, and so they want that piece of the action. Right. But then what happens is at the end of your life, you know, a piece of the action will not give you peace of mind. Mm. Uh, we've we've talked about this before. I had the pleasure for for those of you that may have may not know it. Uh, I had the opportunity to interview Mark about three months ago, Mark, and um, and we talked about this. And it, it's it's poignant. I'd love for you to go through it again, um, a little bit about what where the, the path you're going down now. Talking about peace of the action, peace of mind, and peace of you know the different stages of life in terms of where you're at. Can you go through that? Those three yeah, phases? Yeah. I think there's three chapters in life. I'm mm. in the third one. The first one is piece of the action. And okay. that's from your teens to probably your mid-30s. Okay. You're looking for a piece of the action. Looking for a piece of the action. All right. And, uh, and that's, doing, uh, uh, that's doing what you should do, meaning okay. you have to build credibility. Mm. You can't just say, I deserve a piece of the action. Okay. You've got to earn it. Sure. So you're working hard. You're trying for that promotion. Right. You're putting in the hours. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and, okay. that, and that's what you, you do what you should do. Okay. And then from about 35, 40 to 60, mm-hmm. that's peace of mind, and that's about balance. Mm-hmm. So you say, you know, my career is okay, but I'm what do I really some, want in life? What do I really want? Right. It's kind of empty. Okay. Uh, and so you, you, you uh, that's doing what you could do, living up to your potential, but mm-hmm. also tapping into those other things so that your life is balanced. Okay. And then when you're o- over 60, which I am, even though I look pretty you good. You look great. I look good. <laughs> I won't tell you. Uh, uh, he looks great, folks. <laughs> for a guy on Medicare Part <laughs> D. But uh, 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 for over 60 is a piece of? Uh, peace. Uh, that's, uh, that is peace on earth. Mm. And that's what you were meant to do, what you were born to do. Meaning what? Meaning you're looking for harmony in your relationships? Meaning well, you're well, looking for just looking for harmony, quiet? But for, <laughs> well, well, for me, you know, I, I guess you know, maybe it's a little bit of an ego trip, but it's okay. my legacy. And yeah. so I, I have a personal mission called Healing the World One Conversation at a Time. I love that. And so I think what I did with Nancy is that conversation, I mean, mm. she gave up her suicidality. Yeah. 
she hit and not her. only did she give up her suicidality, she decided to give back to other people that were feeling Absolutely. that way. So you kind of, because of your ability to really listen to her, manage to, to one of the, you know, it, it's sort of like you liken it to a lake where you throw the pebble in and mm -hmm. it just rippled, right? Mm -hmm. So who knows how many people Nancy in turn was able to help, Absolutely. who were able to help, who were able to help. Well, because I, I think the best thing is to be completely of service mm. uh, uh, and full of compassion and assistance to the downtrodden. And uh, my, my, <laughs> no, my, my new mantra is uh, be generous, be completely of service yeah. to the decent. But service doesn't pay, Mark, right? This is what society is going to tell you. Service doesn't get me, doesn't pay my bills. Service doesn't no. get me, you know, that, that promotion. But how do you, how okay. do we talk so, to society so, so right the now? Because society needs this message. So here's the pledge drive. I'm much more <laughs> famous than I am uh, rich because I don't monetize. So, <laughs> but the point is, I'm, uh, I think I'm, uh, I'm on a good roll. I think I'm helping the world a little bit. Okay. Something I wanted to point out to men, though, because a lot, most of the men probably have just tuned this out because this sounds like a chick flick. But, uh, uh, but something I discovered from my last mentor. Now, if you're in a mentor position, you could be a, a man, you could be a woman. And my last mentor, this fellow Warren Bennis, died in 2014. And a year later, I had something called an anniversary reaction. And I'm a psychiatrist, and an anniversary reaction means sometimes on the anniversary of a death or, or something awful, you're just out of sorts. Now, mm -hmm. I know what that is, but I never experienced it. And a year after he died, I experienced it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, my God, he died a year ago mm -hmm. and I realized what it was about and I wrote a blog I'm a co-founder of something called heartfelt leadership heartfelt leadership you can go there uh, and check uh, check that out but what I realized is and this is where you as a mentor whether you're a, mo a, a woman or a man you not only can help people succeed you can heal people and what I realized that was special about Warren is not that he respected me even though his respect was important he enjoyed me so when I saw him, I put a smile on his face mm -hmm. that had nothing to do with what we were going to talk about. Right. Uh, now, did that have more to do with you or with him, though? Was he the type of guy that looked for the positive aspect in whoever he was meeting with? Oh, if, if you look up Warren Bennis Memorial Service, it's on Vimeo, USC, you will see people, you will see someone who is beloved. You will see David Gergen get emotional. Mm -hmm. You don't see that ever. Yeah. Uh, and what it was is, he wasn't just respected, he was beloved. Mm. And Probably it, because of his love for people though, right? And because he got it from someone also, yeah. you know. And, uh, but, you, but you can do that. And so mm. if you're a mentor, yes, certainly focus on the project, but every now and then pause, uh, look at the person you're mentoring, look mm. into their eyes and say, are you okay? No one does that. Who does that? When is the last time someone looked at you and said that, are you okay? Mm -hmm. And how many times would I have liked to have gotten that question posed to me? Mm -hmm. You know? Either. But we don't, though, Mark. So how do we shift society's mindset, except for through some of these conversations, reminding people out there that we need to go beyond just this surface level of what can you do for me, what can I do for you? You know, you talk about in the book um, at one point to your point about this um, being interested versus interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to me a little bit about that. So, so Warren was filled with these incredible Warrenisms. I mean, if you look up Warren Bennis, you'll see these amazing quotes. So, one of them. So, was he? Was he? Sorry, just to interrupt. Was he a, a medical doctor as well? Was no, no, he, he was a. a I don't, I'm not familiar with him. Uh, no, he was a. He was, was he at a the Marshall guy? School of Business. He okay. was a business guy right. at USC for mm -hmm. 35 years, and he was one of the creators of the field of leadership. Okay, great. And so, so one of his again was be a first class noticer. Mm -hmm. uh, another one of his was be more interested than interesting, be more fascinated than fascinating. And one of my favorites was, uh, was boredom occurs when I fail to make the other person interesting. Huh. So, I mean, you can, you can take those all to heart. Hmm. And, and I guess what I would say to you is try it. Okay. Just try it. How, how, do we, how do we try it? So you and I are sitting down, I just met you. 
and I'm all about trying to show off, right? It's human nature, especially in this digital world that we live in of Instagram and, and, and selfies and the whole thing. So I'm a 22 year old kid and the last 10 years of my life have been all about me, me and me and me. So I come and meet you and my instinct is to try to make myself look as great as I can. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it wrong, right? In, well, what I would do, now this is not for everyone, uh, is I would give you a taste of it by doing it. Okay. So we're talking, <laughs> and, and, I'd, uh, uh, and we can do this offline, and we have. Sure, yeah. Like, yeah. And, I, and if you were that 22-year-old yeah. Katerina, I'd yeah. say, uh, um, uh, so, so where do you want to be in a year? Okay. Why And why that? Okay. How's it going for you? Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the big things getting in the way now this is you showing interest in me right mm -hmm. those are some of the questions mm -hmm. we pose rather than you coming to the table saying hey I'm Mark and I'm an author and I've written seven books and I'm 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 well I'll tell you I, this is this is a uh, since just listen was written I've become a worse listener <laughs> so I'm just gonna I'm gonna pause you right there because for those of you who don't know just listen has been translated into 30 languages it's incredibly 17, popular 17 but I'll take Se 17 but we'll say could be 30 mark you never know right parts of Africa um, how have you become a worse listener that doesn't make sense <sighs> what do you mean well I'm even doing it here is uh, well you know look I'm, I'm an expert so you're listening to me but I will tell you um, because I was an outsider okay. and an outlier, uh, I, I still I need to show off too much, and I'll name drop. Now, now there it's all legitimate, and you might say, Mark, everybody does that, yeah. But, but when I can let go of now, that's okay. I can name drop here mm -hmm. on a radio show. Sure, yeah, right. This okay. is where you name drop, right? <laughs> yeah. But I can tell you when I've let it go and I've just been there listening to someone else. Mm -hmm. That's my best. That's the best part of me, mm -hmm. and I never want to lose that because, uh, because you know, being a show off, being uh, being famous, it's intoxicating and it's corrupting. But I'm gonna I'm gonna pause you right there because in in some instances people have reason to show off, and you do in this case because your book, um, you have just been invited to Moscow by mm -hmm. the Russian government. They have translated your book, and it is even more popular in Russia than it is in the USA. They, they are in love with this book in Russia. So, Go ahead, yeah, so, so tell I, us a little bit about this so because, you know, to your point of, oh, you know, I, I'm showing off. Well, sometimes people like you should show off. This is a pretty big achievement. Tell me a little bit about this uh, Russia-Moscow invitation. Well, this is really kind of fascinating. A and also, it's, um, it's fascinating the power of being an American who's willing to walk away from money. <laughs> so what okay, happened is they, re they reached out to me and they said, you know, your book, Just Listen, mm -hmm. has done very well. This is the Russian version you're yeah, showing yeah, us, okay. Yeah. And they said, uh, we'd like you to come and speak to the Russian government, to the Russian Federation, do a one-day training in Moscow. And, I, and, and there was a pretty good fee. And I said, huh. you know, I'm not going to come there to teach negotiation. I'm, only, I'm not going to teach you how to win at a deal. I'm going to teach you how to win at life. And I may come across as too soft. Your negotiators will say, you know, who is this guy? Mm -hmm. And so I don't want you to fail. I don't want to fail. Okay. Uh, and so uh, if, Thank, you want, if, anyway, if you're wanting yeah. me to come there to teach people how to win, I'm the wrong guy. Wow. And then okay. they came they back, say? And they came <laughs> back a couple of days later and they said, uh, you'd walk away from, you know, we've never really met an American who would walk away from money. <laughs> and I said, I think I just did. And then a couple of days later, they said, uh, we might want to do a series with you. Oh, wow. <laughs> there you go. Because, there because, you go, because, folks. Because, because you're right. You're right. right you there. Say, this is what Russia needs. Yeah. Doesn't want it because we're just like the rest of the world. And here's the interesting thing. The translation of mm -hmm. Just Listen in Russian is much better than Just Listen. And what the translation is. The translation of the title, you mean? The title. Okay. A and I would love to ch uh, change the American title, but it's done so well. What this means is I hear you through and through. Huh. So they got the point of the book. The point is really getting past listening and hearing people. So I, I'm really tickled. And We I have um, we have a, a clip of, uh, of the website that yeah, you're on right now. So uh, bbi.club, and there's, a, there's a, uh, an image of you 
getting ready to speak. When are you going to be speaking to uh, them? October 19th in October, Moscow. you'll be in Moscow. Fantastic. Yeah. So yeah. anyone that happens to be visiting Moscow that may happen to be Russian, yeah, so you know, look so out for Mark. So Putin, are you listening? There you go. <laughs> but, but you know what, I, I, I think they probably appreciated your... Because I'm sure, you know, the rest of the world has this um, this notion that Americans are only about money, right? They're only mm -hmm. money-grabbing, money-hungry, money, 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 capitalism. So for you to have come to them and said, I I'll come, but I'm not going to do it in a way that, you know, that that, that is going to be contrary to my value system. Mm -hmm. And they actually came back to you with an even bigger package. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So a little bit, uh, there's a, you know... There's a testament to staying integral integral to your own value system. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll tell you, if you can determine what your values are, and if mm. they happen to be not about serving you, but about something beyond you, I will tell you, it may hopefully it won't take as many years as it took me, but the world will eventually beat a path to your door mm. because they're so disappointed in everything everyone. else. So if for those of you who are uh, listening don't be ashamed about caring about people mm -hmm. um, uh, my new mantra is uh, is to be generous and s of service to the deserving people in the world to have unrelenting compassion kindness and assistance to the downtrodden mm. and have nothing to do with the entitled <laughs> So it's Welcome to 2017. So, so, I, so I'll tell you, someone comes in and I, and I feel, this person feels entitled to more than they deserve. Yeah. I, you I, check I, out. I, I yeah. start to get nauseated. Yeah. Well, I wish there were more people like you in the world, Mark. I really do. Um, you know, because uh, we need that right now. Um, one more thing I want to bring up because this is really interesting. It has nothing to do with Just Listen, uh, or maybe it does. You are uh, doing something right now called the Return of Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, explain that a little bit to people because there's an element of listening involved in that. Well, here's the deal. Um, the book I'm meant to write. Mm. Uh, the book that you haven't written yet? That I haven't written. Okay. It's about half written. But it's about, uh, in I won't give you the title, but instead of settling for coping, why not heal? Because hmm. uh, I, I have a protocol that helps people heal from the inside out because I know how to get to people from the inside out. Okay. And just like a physical wound, mm -hmm. you clean out a wound, you put a drain in it, and it heals from the inside out. So that's what happens with psychological wounds. You go to the core, and it gets kind of scary and sad, but you go there, and you keep them company, and they will heal from the inside out. Okay. But if you have to check a box because you know you have to see a certain number of people and you know every sure. 20 minutes you won't do that and they'll pull away, okay. and, and and so uh, uh, I got off track and so uh, you were we, well we started with Steve Jobs and then you oh, were okay talk okay, about okay so what happened yeah. is uh, and this is this this is interesting is since I learned how to hack into people and see the world through their eyes, yeah. I actually figured out how Steve Jobs sees the world. Okay. And so, uh, uh, now Steve Jobs has been dead for a number of dead. years, Mark. He, he's been dead. You know that, he's right? Been <laughs> he's, okay. been, he's been dead. And and what happens is I do this program, uh, uh, or this it's a performance mm -hmm. where I play Steve Jobs coming back from the dead, uh, uh, and I tell you this is how I turned around Apple from '97 to 2007. But I share my thinking. But what's really interesting is I'm much more bold as Steve Jobs. And here's the thing. People are beating a path to my door to hear about Steve Jobs. Hmm. People are not beating a path to my door to learn how to listen. So, huh. so, so but I'll get, can I give you a taste of the Steve Jobs persona? Absolutely. Okay. So, so you're uh, sort of channeling him and then parlaying what you feel he would be saying to a crowd if he was around. Right. right okay. Right, okay. So right. do it. Yeah. Okay. Go now. So great. Uh, Here we go. So here's a segment from it. I don't have the horn room glasses, but. I, I you don't have the turtleneck on right now, the black. I, I, but uh, I, I but I I'll, I'll pretend. I will. Okay. So here's one of the segments. I'd say about the a-hole thing. <laughs> you know, when I was at Apple, I was an a-hole. I mean, when you're 24, you're an out, outlier, and you're worth $100 million, a lot of people you're going to get even with. Plus, Wozniak, anyone who walks around with five pencils in their pocket, they're just, they're, they're just, uh, they're just aiming for it. you got to take someone like that out. But here's the issue. After I got kicked out of Apple... 
you know, I was cooling my heels. I was uh, kind of quiet. When I came back, here's what you have to take away from it. Uh, when I came back, there was an urgency, and uh, and the reason I w acted like an a-hole to a lot of my oversensitive people is because the most difficult thing to do to be successful, uh, and uh, Buffett and Gates said this, is to be able to maintain your focus. Everybody is trying to pull you off focus. Uh, you get stuff in your head that's a little bit of bipolar, a little ADD, a little bit, you know, mashugana, whatever the hell it is, but it's trying to pull you off your focus. And so people knew at Apple that when I was walking around and I was thinking, don't you ask me a question, don't you smile, don't you say hello, because I might rip you a new one, because I'm trying to solve something, and everybody who knew me knew that I did my best thinking walking. It's my company. I'm not going to walk around my desk. So <laughs> you got it? And if you're a founder, by the way, and you can, you can understand this, what you say to your people, because, you know, because if you hurt their feelings and the head of HR says, you got to smooth it over <laughs> with so-and-so, you don't need that nonsense. What you need to do is you say to people, by the way, for the next couple of days, I'm, I'm trying to figure something out in my head. Do not make eye contact with me. Do not interrupt me. Do not ask me anything uh, because you're not going to get the, the best response from me. You got it? So that's sort of an insight. And wow. People, and people say, wow, that, that's exactly how focused people. Right. Well, yeah. how did you come to channel Steve Jobs? Because that was pretty good. Is that pretty good? Well, that was pretty good. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll come and see. Probably it, on it, point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. Uh, well, well, what happened? No, what happened? Uh, I can tell you the story. I was doing. Uh, I was doing presentations on listening to CEO roundtables. Okay. And I was getting away with it because I have some pretty good stories. You know, I sure. worked for the O.J. Simpson. You know, I was an advisor to the O.J. Simpson trial and yada, yada. So I have good stories. So I was getting away with it. But decision makers, CEOs, one of the things, the word that they hate more than any other word, even though they can't say it, but I'll say it for them. All entrepreneurs, this is the word they can't stand, people. <laughs> they hate the word people. And, uh, and they're really waiting, you know, they have to figure it out because we need jobs. We need people, but, but right? But they can't but wait to replace people with technology. Right. They won't tell you that, it's right. politically incorrect, but yada, yada, yada. Okay. And so, but what happened is, uh, I decided a few years ago, uh, and this was a personal change for me also, a few years ago I said, I am not going to persuade another human being to do anything the rest of my life. I'm done with it, too much heavy lifting. Mm. And so I came up with this idea, if I could figure out how to create gotta have it, mm. you don't have to sell anyone. So I figured out the formula that would cause a customer to say, I gotta have it, that would cause an investor to say, I gotta invest there, that would cause talent you're trying to attract, say, I gotta work there. And I'll tell you what the formula is. Yeah, I'd love to get the formula. So here's the formula. Okay, and, get and a pen and paper, people, because no, this is important. No, no, you, will, you will write this down. Yeah. Uh, some of you will even remember. Um, the formula for creating gotta have it yeah. uh, is woe, wow, hmm, yes. And so what woe means is uh, you're distracted and y I've created woe when someone's distracted or I'm making a presentation, someone el elbows the person next to them and say, what did he say? Whoa. What did he say? Yeah. Or can you repeat that? So woe is I can't believe what I just saw, heard, or read. Some of you have even written this down because whoa, wow, hmm, yes is a whoa, wow. Okay, right. And, and, then, <laughs> wow, and then wow is, that is unbelievable. That's astonishing. That is so simple. And then the hmm is, this is too good to forget. This is too good to ignore. I don't know how I'm going to use the whoa, wow, hmm, yes, but I'm going to use it. And then the yes is, figured out how to use it, sold. Hmm. So what happened is I went back to these round tables and I said, here's the formula for how to create uh, got to have it, yeah. and someone said, you just figured out Apple <coughs> and Steve Jobs. I said, huh. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, whenever a new product comes out, you'll see with the iPhone 8. People uh, are lined up down the street, and, and what right? what are they thinking? Yeah. I got to have it. Right. Uh -huh. And so, uh, uh, and then part of my presentation, I show a video dramatization of Steve Jobs visiting Xerox Park. And at Xerox Park, he discovered something called the graphical user interface. Okay. I'm sure the people in the, uh, Back in the technology day. room right. are liking this, hopefully. Okay. Uh, wake up, wake up. <laughs> uh, and uh, what, what that was the mouse okay. and the icons. Hmm. And so, uh, uh, and there's actually a segment where he talks about visiting it, but there's a dramatization. If you go to National Geographic, American Genius, Xerox Park, there's okay. a dramatization. And basically what you see on 
the person who played Steve Jobs, what you see on his face when he sees the graphical user interface at, uh, at Xerox Park yeah. is you can see in his eyes like like the whoa, light bulb going like, off, whoa. right? Whoa, yeah, whoa, wow. And what he was thinking mm. is, whoa, I can't believe what I just saw right. with the mouse. Okay. The wow is that's astonishing, that's amazing. Yeah. The hmm in this thing, he turns to Wozniak, and Wozniak says, once they go there, they're not they're not turning around, they're not going back. And then the yes is the Macintosh. So if you have a marketing department, if you're trying to get through to anyone, if you're tr uh, if you're trying to woo an investor, you figure you out your whoa wow because mm, yes because formula. If, if you having if you don't create whoa wow mm, yes, you're creating nah, never mm. mind, no thanks, pass. Well, I hope we've created a little bit of whoa wow mm, yes. We're at the top of our hour, and this is the thing that I love about you, Mark, is I could sit here and talk to you for another hour. I'm sure our listeners would love to sit and talk to you for another hour. Um, we want to know, just in summary, your top three tips for listening well. What would you advise people? One, two, three. I have a conversation I need to get through tomorrow. What should I do? Um, this is really counterintuitive. It's what I call the power of a un unsolicited apology. Because uh, Why is it powerful? I will tell you, there are hundred mil uh, hundreds of millions of people who will never be apologized to in their life, and people are defenseless. So if there's someone that you need to get through to tomorrow, if you, uh, if you say, uh, if it would be okay, I think I owe you an apology. Huh. They certainly have their attention. They're, well, they're going to say, for what? And then when you look at them, you could say, what have I failed to understand that's important to you? Wow. <laughs> And then, uh, oh, oh, yeah, you can see that. And then geez. they're going to tell you. And then if you want to drill deeper, because what's going to happen is some of them are going to tear up, but they're going to lean into the conversation. Mm. And, and if you say to them, what has been the negative effect of my not only failing to understand, but not even wanting to understand it? They're going to lean into that. And then the third thing you can say is, um, would you give me the chance to correct that? I'm sorry, would you give me the chance to correct that? And I promise not to interrupt you. Good Lord, how do you not get a buy-in with that kind of open? Yeah. I'd like to have that conversation. I'd like to, uh, geez, there's a number of people I'd like to say that to, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mark, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for um, having me. It you. really has been a pleasure. Uh, congratulations on Just Listen. It's been out for a few years now, but it was it's an important book. Um, and clearly, it's still popular around the world. We are uh, thrilled that you're getting the recognition yeah. that you deserve. And, um, and we're excited about this, uh, the Steve Jobs. Um, if people want to find out more about you and the work that you do and, and some of the services you provide, where can they find you? Well, probably the, uh, I'm Donald Trump. Go to at Mark Goulston. <laughs> uh, we were talking about no ego. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> go to at, at Mark Goulston, but I do ha I, I have a few websites, uh, markgoulston.com, okay. M-A-R-K-G-O-U-L-S-T-O-N.com. Goulston Group is my consulting company. Something you can help me with, go to popprotocol.org, P-O-P-protocol.org. That's a whole other show. Okay. I'm part of a 501c3, and uh, the L.A. Sheriff's Department is now partnering with us. Okay, and what it's do you a do? Pr it's a yeah. program that helps community uh, and law enforcement know what to do at a traffic stop. Oh, and, wow. And, so, and the tagline is saving lives one traffic stop at a time. And I'll give you our four-step acronym, okay. which is simple. And this is what you have to tell your kids to do, uh, your teenagers, young adults. And the acronym is SAFE. Okay. And standing so for? Standing for. Well, if you pull over, we, you have to realize that police are trained to look at where your hands are in sudden movement. So mm -hmm. put the light on your dome light up if, if it's night. Okay. And then sh uh, show your hands palms up on the steering wheel. If you're African American, your palms are you know lighter, mm -hmm. so they can see that. Or out the window, show your hands. Okay. A, ask for permission. So you say, mm -hmm. you know, my uh, my, my ID is my in my I purse. My can ID I is in my right. purse, sure. along with a registered handgun. Okay. Oh, and to let them know that yeah, I'm carrying a yeah, gun. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. And then, then F is follow instructions. Okay. And then E is exchange respect. So it's sir, officer, sir, officer. Hmm. 
Uh, and what's happened is we've been doing these trainings, and uh, we're going to do a public service announcement in the next month. They're going to push out. Okay. And and the change in the attitudes between the inner city youth and the police mm -hmm. is remarkable because. Are you teaching this to both sides then, to the law enforcement side and to the and to the well, community? Well, uh, we're teaching it mainly at community sites, but okay. I think that but there are going to be six. Uh, uh, LA Sheriff's Department stations that are about to use body cams that are going to be promoting it. So okay. they reached out to us because right. the Sheriff's Department really wants to show that they're embracing the gotcha. community. Okay. And so. And what uh, was the website again, Mark? Popprotocol.org. Popprotocol.org. There we go. And uh, and visit me on any of those sites. Absolutely. Well, um, please check it out, folks. Uh, also, if you want to pick up a copy of Just Listen. You can do so probably at Amazon is the easiest, right, Mark? Yeah, yeah Amazon. Amazon, your website, I'm guessing. Uh, Are you selling them on the website? No, if not, yeah. Mark, we got to help monetize no, no, your, no, your, uh, so uh, many of your you ideas. Want, <laughs> uh, no, I don't sell anything on my website. So, you know, yeah, because I'm busy leaving the world better than I found there it. There you but, go. But Katarina is going to help me with this. Uh, and we're we're going uh, to figure out a way to, to really continue to add value, Mark. And that's why I love sitting down with you, because I know you genuinely want to do that. And, uh, and so do we here. Uh, thank you for taking the time to visit us. For you at home, thank you for... Um, taking the time to sit with us again book circle is uh, such a fabulous fabulous website because you know people just don't read enough anymore and there's so much goodness you can learn from books and you know this is why we bring you this programming because in case you don't want to actually read the book you can listen to us and watch us and that's why we have fun here uh, once again you can catch me on all of my social media platforms at Katerina Kazayas. So tweet me, Instagram me. I like making new friends. Um, and do catch us next time. We thank you for being with us, and we'll see you again. Take care. From managing editor Jason Squamata, executive producers Maria Menunos, Phil Svitek, and Kevin Undergaro, we would like to thank you for tuning in to Book Circle Online. For more discussion, go to bookcircleonline.com. And if you have comments, questions, or book title suggestions, write us at info at bookcircleonline.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this is Book Circle Online. BCO, join the circle. Would you like to discover the secret to getting through to just about anyone? Actually, to getting through to anyone. Well, if so, stay tuned because we're going to let you know how. This is Book Circle Online, featuring in-depth discussion, insight, news, and commentary on all the world's leading book titles and their authors. And now, Book Circle Online. All right, everyone. Thank you, and welcome to another edition of Book Circle Online. This is your favorite platform for all things books, and we are really excited to be here. I'm your host today, Katerina Kazayas, and I am joined in studio by the great Mark Goulston. Mark, welcome to the program. I'm so excited, I, I think I have spit in the corner. Right <laughs> my my <laughs> wife would point we're gonna, out. We're yeah, gonna we wipe are, ourselves yeah, yeah. first, that's right. Well, thank you for being here with us. Always glad to Yes, absolutely. We are gonna be discussing Just Listen. So for anyone out there that has ever had difficulty getting that other person to just listen to you you know you have something to say and for whatever reason it's just not being heard how do you get through to them and how do you get your point across when you have something really important to say you've written a book mark called just listen and we're gonna delve into all of that today before we do that uh, I'd like to introduce exactly who you are because I know who you are but we're gonna kind of help the guests uh, understand the significance of us having you here in the studio with us. So, you are a business advisor, you are a public speaker, you are a coach, you are also a psychiatrist, psychologist. Psychiatrist. Psychiatrist. I get them I always have some mixed meds up. For you right there now, we go. Yeah. I was going to say, someone needs to help me out. Um, and you have um, been featured many times. You are an author of quite a few books. I think it's six or seven now. Seven now. Seven books. Fantastic. So you're here to impart a little bit of your wisdom with us. You've also been on guests um, on, you know, prominent, prominent shows like CNN and Fox News, uh, the Washington Post. So it's a real thrill for us to have you here. 
Well, I'm glad to be here. I, I can hardly wait to find out what we talk about. <laughs> That's right. Uh, before we do get started, a uh, really quick reminder that you can follow us uh, across all of our platforms here at Book Circle, and we know you get excited to do that. Book Circle Online is probably where you're catching us, but we also stream on YouTube and on podcast. So, Mark, they can find us everywhere. Good. Which is great. That's um, I want to know, just listen, why a book on listening? What happened? What did you go through? What have you seen in life that caused you to want to write something that helps people become more proficient at listening to each other? Well, you know, like most things in life, you, usually there's some sort of a, a bad, down, dark time that mm -hmm. teaches you the biggest lessons in life. And I remember when I was a psychiatrist at UCLA, one of the worst days I had, I was called by the oncology doctors to see a patient. They paged me and they said, we need an order to put this patient in restraints and to medicate him. I'm a psychiatrist because he's pulling his respirator out, he's pulling the IVs out, he's kicking, and could you come up and write an order? You know, because he's just right. all over the place. So I go into his room and his eyes were as big as saucers. I mean, just like, like, like this. And he was screaming at me through his eyes because he had a respirator tube in. And I said, what is it? And they said, he's just, he's just psychotic. You know, that's why we have to restrain him. And I said, what's going on? And he's, he's screaming at me and his and eyes are like that. this. Yeah. Oh, and, and then uh, I, I gave him a pen to write something down. He's in restraints and he just scribbled. And I, and I thought, well, maybe they're right. And I said, uh, I wrote an order to calm you down, mm -hmm. we're gonna have you. I need to do something with that information. How do I sit here and just listen to you for you? Well, I think uh, if you can go into a conversation, and, and, I, and one of my, my last mentor who passed away was a big leadership guy named Warren Bennis. If you search the name Warren Bennis, he, uh, he, w he was one of the top three people in leadership. Okay. Uh, and one of the things that Warren used to say is be a first class noticer. Hmm. And so noticing is different than looking, watching, or seeing. So if I'm looking into the camera lens, into your eyes out there, uh, you know, if I'm just looking, watching, or seeing, I see that there's a camera lens looking at me. I'm trying not to be awkward, uncomfortable looking into a camera <laughs> lens. But if I can imagine that I'm noticing through the camera and I'm looking into your eyes, and if you're looking into my eyes, and if you let me look into your eyes, and if I'm looking for where, where the hurt is, where the anger is, where the discouragement is, and I am only looking to notice it and join you there. So one of the things I discovered in being a suicidologist, and I'll teach people now mm -hmm. how to do it, but I don't do it now on the front lines. This was a really poignant thing, and it was a real lesson towards the end of seeing suicidal people, and these were multiple attempters who had failed all kinds of things. So imagine if you're feeling that, and if you are feeling that, I want to tell you there's hope. Mm -hmm. Thank you for tuning in, but there is hope. Get yourself listened to. Go. Uh, <laughs> Bye, just listen. Bye, just listen. Uh, and, and so if you can imagine that mindset, uh, and you've tried things, and a lot of times professionals will give you things to try, and you will <laughs> nod from the neck up knowing you're not going to try it. Mm -hmm. So what I used to say to some of these people, because I would listen to them from the inside out, so imagine if you're that in that place, and I'll look into the camera, and what if someone said to you, if it's all right with you, I'm not going to give you any advice or solutions that you're not going to follow. <laughs> and then you're going to have to come back and tell me why you didn't do it, and you weren't even asking me for the advice or solution. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna find you wherever you are, and I'm gonna keep you company there as long as it takes, and you're gonna walk out. And I'm not gonna come up with any solutions or advice until you get so bored with my keeping you company that you say, you know, can, can we do something constructive? <laughs> and then we'll come up with something. And so imagine if you're coming from that mindset, and what would happen is they would, they would start to just cave they, well, they, they I was going to say, that's exactly what happened, with relief. what happened with Nancy, right? So going back to Nancy for a minute, uh, did she recover? Did she, did she no, move she out of that dark place? <laughs> oh, it's interesting. Um, she went on and got a PhD. She has a couple of kids. <laughs> but one of the things that I told her, because she, this had been going on for years, okay. and I said, 
don't become a psychologist. <clears throat> Why? So Why did you say that? Well, I said, go have fun. Mm. I said, there's too much sadness. If you really listen into people and feel their emotions so they feel less alone, yeah. uh, it's not depressing, but it's incredibly sad. That's been going on for a decade. And then what she would say to me is she said, I can't just take a regular job knowing that you can walk out of hell and that I did. Mm. So she wanted to be of service. Totally. Okay. You know, you know, wow. And, 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 and she was. And, oh, she was. I mean, wow. I, I, I think she's the best pure therapist uh, you could ever find. Wow. So if you looked so into her go, eyes, people, if you looked hope. in her eyes yeah. and said, have you ever felt so alone and there was no way out and you'd just be better off if you just ended it all? And she would say, I know exactly what that feels she like. She wouldn't even have to say it. Right. Yeah, you could feel it. You know, now I'm, I'm looking out at her and suddenly all the color in the room turns to black and white. So I'm looking out and the color is black and white. This is for you now. For me, I'm okay. seeing black and white. And then it starts to get like cold and chilly and it was like gray waves like you'd see in the highway in a desert. Okay. And it was just almost like quick sandy. And so I thought I was having a stroke or a seizure. Oh my God. Now I'm a medical doctor and right. so I, th I thought, well, it wouldn't be rude to do a neurologic exam on myself because she's like this, <laughs> and so I, I, Poor I'm Nancy. Going, yeah, so I'm going like so, so I'm going like you're this, checking your pulse, like this, you're checking I'm your going like right? this, like oh this, gosh. like this. I'm tapping my knees, and I realize I'm all here. I'm not okay. having a stroke or seizure. So what the heck was going on? We'll take a sip now. Yeah, I was going to um, say. <laughs> then I thought, I have this crazy idea that I'm looking at the world through her eyes. Hmm. That when she's looking like this, what she was seeing was what I was, was seeing this and feeling. Black, dark, cold dark world. Oh yeah, and and years later, I, I shared that with a pastor uh, from St. John the Divine, a Gothic, a big Gothic cathedral in uh, Manhattan. He said, "You went into the dark night of the soul." Wow. I, did, I didn't know Jeez. that at that time. And so, because I was uh, uh, sleep deprived, I actually blurted out something that I probably wouldn't have blurted out. Uh, and you'll understand why. So I, I, I just said, Nancy, I didn't know it was so bad, and I can't help you kill yourself. But if you do, I will still think well of you. I'll miss you. Jeez. And maybe I'll understand why you had to, to get out of the pain. And then I thought to myself, don't write that in the medical <laughs> record. I thought, oh, great, I just oh, gave her no, permission. Oh, no, right. And, and I'm thinking, did I say it? Did I think it? I said, ooh, I said it. And so she looked at me. She looked at me for the for first, the first time. For the first she time. She sort of woke yeah, up, yeah, yeah. And she looked at me like I'm looking into your eyes and see, I can hold your eyes. Right. And I thought she was going to say, thank you for understanding. Okay. I'm, I'm overdue. Sure, right. What did she say? And I said, well, what are you thinking? And she looked right into my eyes like I am looking into yours. Yeah. And she said, if you can really understand why I might have to kill myself to get out of the pain, maybe I won't need to. And then she smiled <laughs> and gave up her suicidality. And so what I then learned yeah. is people are screaming out at us with their eyes, with what they say in between. And, they're, and if you can just listen into people's eyes, if you can look into anyone's eyes, and if you listen for their hopes or dreams, their fear, their anger, their discouragement, and if you just look for that with no other purpose than to be of service. One of my favorite quotes of all time, it could be my favorite, comes from a psychoanalyst named Wilfred Bion. Mm -hmm. And he said, the purest form of communication is to listen without memory or desire. And what he meant is when we listen with memory, we have an old personal agenda that we're plugging people into. When we listen with desire, we have, we have a thing. current, uh, a present or future personal agenda that we're trying to plug people into, but we're not listening to them. But how, this is my question, is you were trained, you weren't even trained to do so. I wasn't you, trained to do you, that. You, you, but you, we were intuitive, intuitive enough to understand that you needed to do that, to be of service to these patients. How does the common person get around their mental agenda? Because we have that, right? 
I mean, I might be here sitting listening to you, but I'm listening to you because I want to go back to what you had said about that wave coming over you and you sort of, you found yourself looking at the world through her eyes. Has that happened to you again? Has it happened since? Does it happen frequently? Oh, it happens all the time. In fact, so I trained FBI and police hostage negotiators. Cool. And actually, one of the things I would do, if you actually look up uh, FBI hostage negotiation, Goulston, okay. G-O-U-L-S-T-O-N, I think it's on YouTube, or Vimeo, one of those things. And what I would do is I would, uh, it was interesting, I, I would come in with a suit, and underneath I had a police uniform on. And what I would do, and you- and Would you, you strip down like Superman? Well, not exactly, because <laughs> what would happen is these are FBI and police, and so you can see it. It's an old, it's in from the, I think the late 90s, and I, and I took off my uh, uh, sport jacket, and underneath it was a police uniform. I hadn't shaved for two weeks. Hmm. Uh, I put on a pair of glasses that I think were broken, okay. and I looked at them, and I said, I'm the guy in your department who shot the kid with the plastic gun last year, <laughs> and I've been on medical leave for a year, and I pulled out a gun, put it to my neck, and I said, I've been on medical leave for a year, and unless you talk me out of it, I'm going on permanent leave. And then you live with the ghost of someone you couldn't save, and this time it's one of your own. And then whatever they would do. Um, Holy crow, this was your training? <laughs> this is my training. Holy what, crow. And, whatever, uh, and, and I got amazing testimonials. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and it was often the, the start of a training day and mm -hmm. got the highest ratings. And, and no matter what they said, I would just rip a, rip them a new one, <laughs> and then I'd pull the trigger. Ah. And I was careful to use a red gun because they say, "Look, these people are highly trained. They see you pull out a gun. They're going to react, gonna, right, baby?" <laughs> and, and then, but from that position, what I could say is, "This is what you didn't ask me." Wow. So I could go into character and play that. Actually, my favorite place, and I would love to do more of this. If any of you can get me a connection, mm -hmm. my favorite place for doing this is. I used to do these programs at uh, penitentiaries okay. to prisoners who were going to be released in the next um, couple of years. In the next six months to eighteen months, it okay. was called rebuilding trust in your family. Mm. So imagine this: I'd be <laughs> in the, the, uh, now you're talking penitentiary. You're not even talking a regular, you know, jail. No, this is this is like full. Yeah, 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 this is yeah. full on. Uh, like Terminal Island was right. a local one that I would go to, and Jeez. the chaplains would bring me in. And so these big muscle-bound, uh, usually third-world, you know, prisoners would come in. They'd all have their Bibles, and so I'd have my, I'd have this kind of jacket on. I take it off. I'd have a black T-shirt on. I grease my hair back. Ha! And so I, and you looked a little and, like and one of them, yeah. So, and then I said, uh, uh, I said, I'm your younger brother. Okay. Your mom always loves you. Uh, and when you get out. Uh, She'll give you a first, second, a third chance because she believes in Jesus. But you know as well as I know that all you'll ever be is a lying sack of crap loser <laughs> who's a disgrace to this family. Uh, and if you really love our family, you, when shape you get up. out, you move. Oh, wow. Jeez. And, and if you ask me. <laughs> and if what you, do these guys think of you, oh, Mark? No, they, well, it's kind of riveting, I guess. And I said, and if you think I should respect you because you're my older brother, Think again. I've been lifting weights too, and I will put your head through the effing wall. How do you uh, how do you like that? Welcome home, bro. And then what would happen is I'd get into character, and I uh, and I I would from the inside out I'd be that younger brother, and then from that role play, uh, and I got to the point where they would they were saying to the chaplain, "Get him away from me." They'd be pushing me away because I wow. get I get so in character, and I, they would see you as that family member, yeah, right? I get two yeah. feet away from them, Jeez. your arms and legs, so you can't kick and pull things out and then when everything calms down we'll take everything away and he's just going mm, 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 and he's screaming at me and you know and then I went about my day and then the next day I get paged by the oncology doctors mm -hmm. and they said we need you back well they said Mr. Jones that wasn't his name is uh, off the respirator okay. he's sitting up and he asked us to page you oh goodness uh oh so <laughs> so I walk into the room and his eyes are calmer, but he's looking into my eyes like I'm looking into your eyes, and he and he seats me in a chair. He says, sit down. Oh, wow. And, with, and I couldn't move my eyes, and he looked at me, and he said, what I was trying to tell you yesterday is that a piece of the respirator had broken off and was stuck in my throat. Oh, my God. And you do know 
that I will kill myself before I go through that again. Do you understand me? Wow. And I looked in his eyes and I said, oh, I'm sorry, I understand. Yeah. But it really taught me that you need to listen into where people are coming from. And then that served me well because I was, a, I was a suicide expert, a suicide interventionist. And probably the real turning point, and this has led to my being able to listen to people from their inside out. So Just Listen is a book about how do you listen to another person from their inside out mm. as opposed to from your, your perspective your of perspective. it. Right. So uh, I was seeing a number of suicidal patients. And one of my first mentors actually started the whole study of suicide, uh, the Suicide Prevention Center in Washington, Los Angeles. And he, what would happen is he would do consultations to still suicidal patients up in the inpatient units that needed to be discharged okay. because you can't keep them there forever. And they're not acutely suicidal, but you can't keep them there forever. Mm -hmm. So he would always uh, meet with them and he'd make a phone call and it would always be the same call. His name was Dr. Ed Schneidman and he'd say, he'd say, Mark, I'm with this lovely young woman. Mark, I'm with this handsome young man. They're in a lot of pain, Mark. You could help them, see them. Mm -hmm. And then they get on the phone and we make an appointment and that was the only way they'd be discharged because someone had to see them. Okay. And so I, I saw a number, you're only supposed to see one suicidal person in your practice. I would say a quarter of my practice were suicidal people. Oh my gosh. And my wife will tell you that I never made it through a movie in 10 years without being beat to page. Wow. So, you know, but, but what it also allowed me to do though is it allowed me to throw away the book and be innovative. And so, uh, there was one patient that I'll call Nancy that really, uh, really brought that home. Um, and I was seeing Nancy, she had made three or four attempts before I met her, before she went into the hospital this time, and I didn't think I was helping her. She would come in, and she wouldn't make eye contact. Mm. If, if you're me, this would be Nancy. Okay. So if you're looking at me... Uh, Just begrudgingly uh, there in she, the room, she, right? Well, she's kind of lifeless. She's sort of like this. Mm. And so I was moonlighting at a state hospital over one weekend. So once a month, you'd moonlight, you'd cover for other doctors. And this was at a state hospital uh, in called Mo Metropolitan Hospital in Norwalk, California. And so I'd been up about 36 hours. So for any of you who have ever pull, pulled an all-nighter. I'm sure a lot of doctors listening have. <laughs> and college students. You know sure. that your physiology and your mind plays tricks on you. So there I am Monday uh, seeing Nancy. And she's in her usual pose like this. And so I'm seated with her, and again, I didn't think I was helping her. I've been seeing her for about six months. She was coming in two to three times okay. a, a week, and I didn't, uh, uh, that was long as she gone without being hospitalized, so maybe I was helping her, but I didn't think I was doing anything positive. And so on this particular day, uh, I, again, I hadn't slept for 36 hours. 